The interview show would like to thank Cards Against Humanity, Lifeway Foods, It Takes Guts, Field Notes, Vintage Styled Made in the USA Pocket Notebooks at 401 North Racine in Chicago or FieldNotesBrand.com, and Lagunitas. Beer Speaks, People Mumble, except on the interview show. Thirty years, yeah, unbelievable. When you first took the job, were you in a position where you could say, "Look, it, I'll take that job, but only if I'm allowed to do this," or was it absolutely, "I'll take the job, whatever you want me to do"? No, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's it's. I actually, you know, people think that thirty years, it's like I just, you know, was handed the gates to heaven or something, you know, thirty years ago to direct at this wonderful institution, you know, the Goodman, but I actually ran for 10 years prior a fantastic theater that I know some people Wisdom know, Bridge. Wisdom Bridge on Howard Street up in, it was the, yeah, it's the last street in Chicago and, and it was 120 seats and I ran this theater for a decade yeah. and then got a phone call saying, would you like to, you know, interview to become the artistic director and of course, you know, I, I, was, I was sort of ready to do something bigger and something new, but I actually, it was very controversial and I, I, I almost did not get the job by like one vote of the board of directors. Why? What was the what was the you know, argument? It was, was I, the I was sort of controversial. I mean, I was sort of I, I sort of had directed a lot of very controversial productions. Was the Goodman stayed at that point? N not really. You know, it it it, is, it had just introduced new plays by David Mamet and and my predecessor, a wonderful director named Greg Mosier, because of his success with a couple of plays, went to New York. Okay. But it had been fairly stayed for a long time. So my coming in, and I was you know 32 years old, so I was I was pretty young moving into that position. Um, you know, but it was incredibly exciting and it was just something I had to sort of embrace and go with. So what's happened over the past 30 years that you could not have imagined? That you would have said, all right, I know we're going to do a bunch of great plays, I know I'm going to have tons of fun, yeah. but I didn't think we would do something like that. Working with uh, the greatest people who've ever done what they do. So, you know, and I never thought, like, in my life that I would be working with Arthur Miller on his last play. Or that I would have the experience of working with Stephen Sondheim. Uh, or, or John Kander and Fred Ebb, or Tommy Toon, or Hal Prince, or August Wilson. Do you get nervous? Oh yeah, like crazy. Really? Oh ab yeah, everybody gets nervous. But can you operate still at the level that you need to operate if you're? Oh, you get you get past it really quick. Yeah. You just get you just get past it really really quick. You know, I was working uh, on on a project with Edward Albee, who's very intimidating. And I said I said to him early, I said, Do you, Does anybody ever call you Eddie? <laughs> I just thought I'd break the ice. Yeah. And he said, my mother called me Eddie. And I detested my mother. <laughs> and I decided that was, let's not do that anymore. But, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, once, you, the thing about these artists, again, it's like, um, you know, you work with them, like Arthur Miller is an amazing example. He was 89 years old when I worked with him. And he had far more energy than I did. But you know, once you've sort of gotten past that really nervous place and you, you begin to work on a play together, he really, it's like take off the coat, roll up the sleeves, let's just get down to business to making the best possible play. Did you meet or work with Tennessee Williams once? I did, I did. Uh, that's the one that when I tell like uh, people, you know, that I worked with Tennessee Williams, they look at me like I had just said I worked with like Anton Chekhov. <laughs> I had no idea you were that old. <laughs> You know, but I, I did. I was I was extremely I was extremely young. I think I was like in my early twenties, and it was uh, he he saw a production I did of Streetcar Named Desire, and 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 decided for some reason he wanted to work with me on a new play. Wow. So I ended up going down to Key West, uh, and it was uh, a disaster. Really? Yeah, disaster. Because of what? Well, he was he was this extraordinary, vulnerable man. And, and also, he, you know, it's, he, was, he was going through pain, he was having dental work, so he was okay. in constant pain. And he was, frankly, he was an alcoholic, and he was the kind of alcoholic that took one sip of wine 
and he was done for the day. <laughs> so, you know, he was on painkillers, he was on wine, and, and we would just, nothing ever happened. It's just, we would like sit by his pool and we would talk about his play and then he would start telling these incredible stories about all the great artists he had ever worked wow. with. And a play just never no happened. No play ever. No play ever happened. He had an idea for one, but it was just like I'm sitting at the feet of Tennessee Williams. What an yeah. extraordinary, I'm, I'm a kid. And you know, he was very kind, and, and, but no play ever happened. And it's also good to know that the great artists also need dental work. <laughs> <laughs> and we know they need drugs as well. That <laughs> kind of goes without That's saying. That's absolutely true. At a level like the Goodman, and I, this might be just an obvious yes, is making of the art still messy? Is, are there still the 3 a.m. nights? Oh, obviously, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there are. Yeah. You're not a machine that just, we got another play, let's do it. We oh my, out. no, no, no. It's, it's an incredibly messy human endeavor. I mean, that's, that's actually what I love the most about the theater. And there's always drama, there's always beauty, there's an incredible amount of love that goes on in making work. There's an incredible amount of support. You know, you're in a very, very safe spot of a rehearsal room, whether it's an opera, you know, whether you're in opera or you're, you're, you're in the theater. That is, it sounds so pretentious to say it's sacred, but what you're trying to do as a director is create an atmosphere. So you can have a writer like Arthur Miller and you can have an extraordinary actor like, oh, Brian Dennehy or Nathan Lane, you know, or, or somebody like Laurie Metcalf or just Amy Morton, who are just feeling safe enough to be vulnerable you know, which is something so many of us don't have a chance to do. You know, it's just, we don't have that. And you have to create that space, and out of that comes extraordinary work. When, there, when people are, when actors are vulnerable, explain to me, and exp what, what exactly does that mean? Are they bringing out parts of themselves, or are they trying to inhabit, they're trying to inhabit a role, somebody who is not them, a yeah, character. Yeah, yeah. So but, what does it mean to be Well, there's no such thing really, you know, it's, 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 it, the, the artistry, the thing about an actor is it's, it's half imagination and half biography, autobiography. Yeah, yeah. You know, that an actor cannot help but use their life experience, who they are, what they've experienced, how they feel about the world, what they've been through, how they've been bruised, how they've been hurt, how they've been loved, and then their imagination. You know, if you're playing, you know, if you're, if you're playing Blanche Dubois, you know, everybody has a Blanche Dubois part of them, you know, and then Tennessee Williams tells you other things in the text and you just sort of merge them. But it's, it's dangerous, you know, because, you know, emotionally people, you have to just sort of bring people up so that they're exposing themselves and sometimes the worst parts of themselves, you know, the absolute worst parts, the ugliest parts. And that's not something we want to do in our lives. And they get a chance to do it in a room. I went to your IMDb page, yeah. were you in a TV movie about G. Gordon Liddy? I was, I was, I was. Why, why? Yeah, I played large, <laughs> well, I was asked, yeah. and I was very young, and I, I played, I think the role was called Big Stupid Cop. <laughs> and, and I basically, <laughs> I was, I was, I, inf along with another big, or sp it was probably actually small stupid cop. Yeah. We infiltrated an LSD party uh, uh, that Tim Leary was giving. <laughs> and, and, and I was with Robert Conrad, you know, knocked his battery off my, or we used to call him Little Big Bob. <laughs> and, and, and we infiltrated, like walking around a pool trying to pick up hippie chicks, but we were really these big cop, dumb cop, and then. Little Big Bob. And this was a TV movie. It was a, you know, you, you're an act. I was like a director, but I also did act in, in, in Chicago. But they I, aired that kind of stuff on TV back then. I mean, they did. TV, there was no cable. I mean, there was cable, but not, not what we have now. Oh, no, no. This was, this was a true, like, two-hour special on the life of G. Gordon Liddy. Wow. Yeah, really. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So you, so people... I did all of that. I, I, I for, when I was in my early 20s, I always played people who were, like, so often it was, like, large, mentally deficient person. <laughs> And I would wear overalls and make my beard a lot bigger. And I would just drive around in a truck going, well, she here looks pretty, don't she? <laughs> in close up. And that was, that was all they needed, was just a little character acting. <laughs> that's why I know from the great acting, you see. That's, <laughs> I can recognize it in others. With, and it never came along that they wanted to say that part <laughs> is a starring role. We want to make something built around that. And, no, there were no, there were no spin offs. Robert Falls, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. That was great. Hi, 
I'm Catherine Diorio, and this week on Check Please, VCR repairman Justin Kaufman says if you want a place that will fix you up something real tasty, look no further than his humble joint in Humboldt Park. But expert witness Beth Maluski will never plead the fifth when it comes to her recommendation, known for its pricey fixed price menu. Up first, lifelong philosophy PhD student TJ Jagodowski says if you want to find the meaning of life, you've got to wait around for the tamale guy to show up at the hideout. So TJ, what's hiding at the hideout? The, the hideout is, it is a hideout, so it's not easy to find. I don't know if you guys had a hard time. Um, I went by myself and uh, there's no reservations and so I just found a seat at the bar and ordered an appetizer. Um, so that was just a double whiskey with no ice. And then you just wait. It happens when it happens, so keep an ear out because uh, you'll know dinner's coming when you hear tamales. <laughs> Tamales, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that was like two and a half hours after I got there, mm -hmm. and they're just the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah. but tamale guy's really about that ratio of the filling to the corn. So they're they're they're, they're filled well. They go well. down so easily. They go down so yeah. easily. Yeah. I yeah. love it. Well, Justin, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I I went with my uncle, mm -hmm. uh, and he loves tamales, and that's great. You know, he and his wife and and his friend Gary, and that was that was great. Um, I I thought it was great, but I, I had a problem with it was a show going on. It was. Really yeah. annoying in the back where it was a guy on stage and I don't know, he was. You went on a Friday? I did go on a Friday. And don't it just, go on a Friday. Yeah, my husband I and I went that. too, yeah. I don't know if there's some sort of deal on Friday nights at this <laughs> the, this show and this guy has that, that he gets. His uncle must own the he place must, yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to mess up a Chicago institution like the it hideout. Really right? What I like it about that place is that there is a real sense of community and that community is bounded stronger by its dislike for the interview show. But it, I have a question, you know, the tamales, you just really oh, like the tamales. I mean, do you think those redeem the hideout even on a night that the interview show is there? I just don't see any reason to go on a Friday. Mm -mm. Yeah, you know, any like, other night. Yeah. So it just sounds like it just wasn't firing on all cylinders on Friday nights. Most of the cylinders that count, the tamales. tamales yeah. All right. Well, TJ, you chose hideout. Sum it up for us. Well, if you like uh, tube-shaped maza in a husk, in a bag, in a cooler, uh, go on not a Friday night and you will not be disappointed. Okay, great. And Beth? Um, take someone there that you dislike on a Friday mm -hmm. uh, and get ready to fill up on delicious tamales. Wonderful. Justin? Uh, tamales, great. Interview show sucks. You can try the tamales for yourself at The Hideout, 1354 West Wabanzia, 773-227-4433. Open for dinner Monday through Saturday. Reservations are not understood, and the average tab per person without drinks is five bucks, with drinks, 105 bucks. Guests on the interview show all share one thing in common. They take risks. We'd like to thank LifeWay Foods, makers of probiotic kefir for making possible this week's It Takes Guts interview. So I grew up right outside of Boston, mm. and I spent more time than I can think mm. hearing Bucky. I heard <laughs> Bucky bleeping Denny, because I think my dad. He said bleeping? Well, he didn't want to swear in front of me, maybe. Really? Uh, that was just my dad. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you're a New Yorker. Yeah. It was the other side for you. Yes. So the term for you must have come, it did, because you say this at the end of the book, it came later in life to you. You did not grow up with the term the way Not I at all, no, I just grew up with Bucky Dent. <laughs> As a hero. You know? Yeah, well, just Bucky Dent. I was in a house in Massachusetts, and, I, and there were these guys working on the roof, and I heard one of them say, Bucky Dent. He didn't say bleeping, he said bleeping. And I just, it just struck me as funny, and I kind of had an idea what he was referring to, but... Yeah. I, I said, hey, you know, what, what you, is that like something that is said around here? Bucky Buckner said, yeah, Bucky Ben Bill Buckner. Have you ever been to Delray Beach, Florida? No, but I know he's got his, his uh, camp down there, and I know he's built a replica of uh, the Green Monster. There. With the scoreboard at the <laughs> moment that it, <laughs> unbelievable. I have not heard from him, actually, which is, uh, I don't know if it's odd. What but, would you do? What would no, you want? I would just, what? Would you want to hear from him? Would you no, no, him? I just thought, you know, because people had asked me, do you think, he'll be upset. And I said, no, I think, you know, he right. knows, he knows I'm not calling him Buck that, you know, he knows that that's what he's called in New England, yeah. all over New England. And, and I'm sure he takes great pride in it. So it's not, it's not a baseball book. No, it's I mean, not. Baseball runs throughout it. Yeah. But I, correct me if I botched the, the plot here. No. But it's, you won't correct me. <laughs> but, it, but it's about, it's about a son and a dad. And the son went to an Ivy League school, but he never yeah. quite lived up to right. his potential as a writer. He's selling peanuts, where he's a bit of a character at Yankee Stadium. Yeah. His dad is kind of a, 
I guess, disgruntled former ad man who, right. who's dying. Yes. Uh, and he's, for some reason, he's a huge Red Sox fan. Yeah. His son is obviously a Yankees fan. They live in New York City. Right. And they're estranged. Yeah. But with the son, with the dad dying, mm -hmm. they come together. And the book is very funny, but it's filled with regret and self-loathing. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes it work is that these two people need each other. To me, it was these guys are both Bucky Dents. You know, these guys, these are not Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle that I'm writing about. I'm writing about, you know, and forgive me, Bucky Dent, for using you as an everyman, but compared to those guys, sure. Bucky Bucky Dent is an everyman or Bucky and Dent. It's like, just to me, was like, we are all Bucky and Dent, you know, and we're all going to get killed by something we're not gonna be, see coming or lay low by it. But the flip side of that is if we are all Bucky and Dent, that we all might have a moment where we hit the ball over the fence. That's true, I hadn't thought of that. That's much more optimistic than I personally That's am, but, but I like that. Sunny and yeah. It's yeah. a sunny disposition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's certainly a, a vein of fiction or storytelling or myth Sentimentality. about fathers, sons, and baseball. Sure, yeah. And you play with it, but I would say the book is in no way, right. it's not sentimental. Right. But you had to know going in that as a writer, hey, I'm, I'm up against some, some odds here yeah. if I'm gonna play with that theme. Odds in the sense of, uh, you know, you're going up against Field of Dreams in a way. Going up, not, a, not as competition, right. but as I could fall into the trap yeah. of maudlin sure. yeah. entity. That's yeah. not a word. <laughs> maudlin hood. Maudlin hood. Yeah, I, I imagine so, yeah. Was it not a worry? I'm a fan of sentiment. I'm a fan of old-fashioned uh, drama, melodrama even. You know, I'm, I'm not afraid to be sincerely sentimental or even maudlin. I don't care. I mean, I, I, know, I know it's not hip and I know, I know irony is, is, is the god, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm a fan of, of the other human emotions as well. I, irony is not an emotion, it's, uh, it's like a denial of it. So I'm all for it. I want, I want you to laugh and cry when you read or when you see a movie or whatever. That's, that's where I come from. So. I, you know, if I fall into being more than sometimes, that's a, that's a hazard, sure. But I'm, I'm it's not. You came to I'm fame sure at the height of, of irony, the I know. '90s. I know. Well, I, I like irony too, sure. Yeah. But, but I also like, I like laughing and crying at something. You obviously you majored in English, mm -hmm. and then you, you went on to grad school. Was it always? Did you get? Was acting? Did acting come in and say, "Hey, this is a good opportunity. You should take this." Not acting oh God, no, no, no! I mean, I, acting never says this is a good opportunity. It's act, acting is a terrible opportunity. Why? Because the odds are awful. I mean, okay. you, nobody in their right mind would look at the odds and say this is something I want to do. They might be better than novelist. Mm. Maybe. But the thing about being a novelist is at least you can practice your art without anybody telling you whether or not you can do it. The, the horrible thing about being an actor is you could love acting and you know never act. You just don't get hired. But I think being a writer, you, it's the ball's in your core. You can write whenever you want. So this was a screenplay at first? It was, yeah. And then how did it turn? I just didn't get made. I got close. Uh, you know, it's an independent film. I would cast it or I'd get one piece and try to dangle it in front of this other actor as, as that piece. Yeah. I got this actor, you know, and, and I've been on that end myself as an actor, and I know how people dangle other actors in front of you. And so we played that game for a while and I still am hopeful that we get to make it, but. Um, so I'm an idiot, because I think why we, I, if I wanted to make a movie, that would be an uphill battle to secure the actors, secure the financing. Yeah. But, but you, you should, you've done well enough in that field that somebody would say, yeah, we'll give it a try. Uh, yeah, but you know, there are certain things against it. You know, oddly enough, it's anything to do with baseball is actually very difficult to get made. Because what if you got Costner in it? At this point, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I gotta ask you, I had a guest on not that long ago, Tavi Gevinson. She's a writer, she's a very young writer, actor. And yeah. I had her on a few years ago. So she was like 14 years old. Really? She was, I mean, she's a, she's a prodigy. And I asked her, I said to her, I said, what, what are you into? And she said, I'm really into looking into getting into different decades, decades in the past. 
And I was like, okay, like like what? Like the 40s, like the 50s? And she's like, well, I'm really into the 90s right now. Right. And at that moment, I felt old. Old, right. Yeah. You are in the now, but you also, as I said before, rose to a certain level of fame in the 90s. Yeah. The 90s, and when people look back at the 90s, one of the things they'll look back at is the X-Files. Yeah. What do you think about the 90s now? Do you think about the 90s ever? Can we write the story of the 90s right now? Like, were they good? Well, I don't know. In the book, I say that each decade is the decade after it. So, the so 90s, explain that. Uh, it's just something that the character thinks in the book um, that, because he's thinking about the 60s. He feels like a child of the 60s, and he, and he is really. But the truth is that it wasn't until the 70s that, that were really the, you know, the free love and even though disco was the music, the the mores and revolution of the 60s didn't really happen until the 70s. And 61, 62, 63, a very clean It was really cut. like the 50s. Yeah, sure. So each decade kind of comes of age in the next decade. So the 90s is really the aughts. I was big in the aughts. <laughs> yeah. The aughts is never going to be anything, let's face it. Because you can't talk about it without saying the aughts, and then it feels weird. That's not right. Yeah. So what's next? What's next writing-wise? Well, I'm working on a novel now. It's tough. It's a tough one, which I'm hoping means good. Never know. And then uh, I'm working on some music, and then uh, I'm actually looking for the next project that I want to do as an actress. I'm just taking it slow that way. Music. You have a, a song in which the lyrics say, hmm. a man of words is a man of lies. Yeah. So just take me through that. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean? Yeah. What do you think it means? I think it means if you're talking a lot, you're telling stories. <laughs> well, that could mean that. What I meant was more pretentious. What I meant was a word is an approximation. You know, we think that we we think we're communicating, you and I, and we're doing our best. I don't think we are. Exactly. Yeah. But we're we're trying. We're approximating thoughts that really have no words in our heads and trying to find a common ground, which are the words. But the that that thought was as soon as you speak, you're lying because you've translated something that is wordless into word. But we've. You sorry you asked that. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm interested because we've just we've just met. Yeah. So of course, you don't know. I know. Oh, it doesn't matter. Whether I mean, just I've read your Wikipedia not. page, so I know a little but bit that, about that you. That doesn't matter. Doesn't but what, matter. if you've known somebody for, if I'm talking to, let's take fathers and sons. If well, I'm that's why to they them, say people that know each other don't need to speak, right? Yeah. But when you didn't they... have to say that. I knew what you were thinking. <laughs> but when they do speak, don't they? Still an approximation. Really? Just epistemologically. I don't know. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. All right. Thank you. David Duchovny. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, I think that, you know, in the past couple of years, there's a group of like 10 women sports writers who have decided to sort of start speaking out about this. There's Jessica Luther, who's got a, she broke the Baylor story. She's got a book coming out in September. There's Jane McManus at ESPN. There's Sarah Spain at ESPN. Been on the show there's, here. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of us, and it just decided that we've just kind of had it. The interview show would like to thank Cards Against Humanity, Lifeway Foods, It Takes Guts, Field Notes, Vintage Styled Made in the USA Pocket Notebooks at 401 North Racine in Chicago or FieldNotesBrand.com, and Lagunitas. Beer Speaks, People Mumble, except on the interview show.